This morning we are uh, really blessed to have with us uh, Joseph Von Cheshire. He was born in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm not going to read the whole bio here, but uh, born in Raleigh, North Carolina, attending public schools, and he spent six years studying at the Broughton School in Broughton, Massachusetts, graduating in 1966. And there he went on to the University of North Carolina, receiving his A.B. in history, and then he attended uh, law school at Wake Forest University and graduating with his J.D. in 1973. Many of you know um, Joe from a lot of public cases and his real passion to be there for the little guy, if you will, uh, the, the least among us. And he has a real passion and heart for uh, the community, the beloved community, as I mentioned this morning in my message. And um, he also has an incredible history, Episcopal heritage. Uh, we're talking about bishop and priest in his background. Um, I imagine he could have gone in that direction too if he wanted to, but law was calling. Um, but Joe is, is just fabulous. He spoke uh, several years ago uh, in my former parish in St. Stephen's in Oxford, and just, uh, it was phenomenal. And uh, so I just want to thank Joe so much for being here with us, with us this morning. So. Appreciate that kind introduction. Uh, I'm still a member of St. Michael's. <laughs> and uh, when Jamie was giving his sermon this morning, which was really beautiful, it reminded me of one of my most embarrassing moments. We always sat over in the nave, and uh, I, John would sit there, he was like three years old, and I would sit, and then Carolyn would sit, that's my wife, and then Joe, who was five years older than John, and we had to keep him apart because of obvious reasons for all these people that are parents. Well, it was a Christmas Eve service, and the preacher, I can't remember who it was at the time, got up in the pulpit and started preaching, and all of a sudden I noticed that John was gone. <laughs> well, all of you parents know that's just one of the worst things in the whole world. And to have it at church on Christmas Eve when the preacher is preaching is about it. And all of a sudden, I saw the preacher was up there preaching. All of a sudden, he went. <laughs> and John had crawled up those stairs and crawled up in the pulpit and was tugging at us. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to say he's changed a lot since then. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you today. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, I have this reputation that I don't understand and don't fully appreciate it, um, but I, I, I'm happy to be here. I had a Sunday school class here uh, for a number of years, and uh, we, we love this place. We moved way out of the country, and it was, uh, we now pray in the fields and on the pond. <laughs> Members of a family should be at peace with each other. It doesn't make any difference what the family is, whether it's your family, or this church, or the city of Raleigh. But members of the family should be at peace with each other. Now I'm going to give you all opinions, or you can draw opinions from what I say, how I feel. I see our nation as a family. That ideal shines across all generations of our history and all the ages of our American dream. For, as you will remember, the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans, If it be possible, as much as it lieth with you, live peaceably with all people. In my view, after practicing criminal law and traveling across this country, speaking and doing cases, for 47 years. We're losing our way as a nation regarding this American dream and Paul's instruction. History is a long record of times like this. Temporarily rising, stretching back to biblical times. Psalm 73 describes them thus. Therefore, pride is their necklace. 
They clothe themselves with violence. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. But the psalm continues. And yet their success is fragile. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed. I was raised in a family tradition on both sides of caring about others with a deep belief in equality of all and all humans. A belief that individual duty is bound by ethics and duty to follow man and God. And I believe, as the German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. And God will not hold us guilty, uh, guilt, guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. And I would ask all of you to remember that every day. As Jamie said, I come from a long tradition of ministers, actually on both sides of my family. There's been a Joseph Lunchesher holding a law license in North Carolina since 1837. I think it's 167 years now. I've got to try to live until I'm 90, I think, to make it 200. <laughs> Joseph Lunchesher first was, was raised to run the largest slave plantation in North Carolina, but he was called to the Lord. He's got beautiful lessons and letters and sermons that I have about this. He founded most of the Episcopal churches in Northeastern North Carolina, and he was the first Episcopal minister that we know of to integrate his church, which he did before the Civil War in Tarboro, a very courageous act. His son, Joseph Munchesher II, was also a lawyer. The first was a lawyer as well. Uh, he became the Bishop of North Carolina. He founded most of the Episcopal churches in Western North Carolina. He walked to many of them to found them. If you go see the Biltmore House and walk into the little town, you'll see one of the churches that he started. He was a wonderful man. Uh, I should also say about Joseph Munchesher the first that he was one, of, along with Speed York's forebears, one of the few white men after the Civil War that founded St. Augustine's, it was now St. Augustine's University, which is the oldest school in America founded to try to educate free slaves. The second was quite a, quite a man. Uh, a lot of people say I take after him and look like, look like him. I don't think anybody could take after him, the bishop. He was an extraordinary man. Uh, he brought the AME Church and the Episcopal Church together. He was the first bishop to do that, which is an amazing feat if you go back into history and see when he did it. And then my granddad, he was a chancellor of the Episcopal Church. He was a wonderful man. He funded a soup kitchen for African Americans during the Depression. And when he died, I'll talk about him again in a minute, when he died, I was 12 years old, and I carried the cross at his funeral at the Good Shepherd. And we got into the cars to go to Oakwood. And African Americans lined both sides of the street all the way to the seminary, two to three deep, because Mr. Cheshire was passed. And then my dad, you all, some of you knew my dad, he was a crusty little man. <laughs> He, uh, I like to tell the story that when I was doing the Duke of Cross case, Dad was dying. And I went down to see him almost about three, four times a week. But his buddies went to see him. Four of his best buddies went to see him. And they said, Joe, you can really be proud of your son. You can go to your maker being really proud of your son. And my dad said, Well, my dad cursed all the time. 
In fact, at his funeral, Bishop Ed Eskel called me before he died and said, Joe, I'm having a problem with your dad's homily. And I said, what's that? I don't know how to talk about your dad without using the words, God damn it. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, they were saying, you really have to be proud of your son and the work he's doing with uh, Duke. And he, he, said, he said to him, he said, you know, I wanted him to be a corporate lawyer. I wanted him to be a regular person. And he just couldn't do it. <laughs> And his mom and I were embarrassed for a long time. But, but, but we got proud of him. We saw what he did as a ministry to him, and we got proud of him. And, and so, yeah, I've been proud of him. What is, excuse my language, what does the little bastard do here at the end of my life when I've got to go meet my maker? He represents a damn dude athlete. <laughs> now, now, he said, how am I supposed to go to my God? Knowing that my son represents a good guy. That was my dad. Uh, my, my grandfather on my mother's side was a Baptist minister. And he founded most of the YMCA's in uh, Eastern Russia. And he married a Russian Orthodox woman, beautiful woman. And uh, most of her family were murdered in the Communist Revolution. They managed to escape, came here. My grandfather uh, founded about seven small Baptist churches, ended up in uh, South Carolina, uh, Beach Island, South Carolina. So I bring in my life a, a passion for um, Christianity. And the words of Luke about such blessings were taught to me at a very early age. To whom much has been given, much is required. And to whom much has been entrusted, even more is demanded. Everyone in this room, is one thing I want to talk to you all about, has been blessed. All of us have suffered. You have to suffer to live. But we've all been blessed. And so, I've always believed those words. And I'm not sure whether being one to whom those words apply, in some ways, is a blessing or a curse. Because loving others and trying to help others, i found over my lifetime, has been the hardest thing I've ever done. The most misunderstood. It's also the most beautiful thing I've ever done. When I was 12 years old, my grandfather, who I spoke to you about, was slipping into senility, and he knew it, and shortly after death. When he first got sick, still had his mind, he called me to his bed. He was such a gentleman. And he told me, he said, Son, some people are born in this world, and they can't help anybody because they have brain problems, physical problems. Some people are born and they have the ability to help five or ten people. Some people can help scores of people. Some people hundreds. Some people thousands. Some people even hundreds of thousands. And when you lie where I lie now, and you know that you're going to meet your maker, what you want to be able to say to yourself is, with what God gave me, I did the best that I could to touch as many lives as I could possibly, possibly touch. And if you can do that, you can shut your eyes and you can go in peace. Well, those words have haunted me in some way all my life. But those are the, that was the essence of all of my teachings. When I was in elementary school here, um, I've always been a person, one of the reasons I do what I do, is I hate bullies. I hate them. I see government as bullies. Uh, I hate to see what bullies do to people. I had two of my friends, I won't say their names, but they were my buddies. One of them was a big fat boy. Being a big fat boy back at that time was hard. The other was a nerd. Probably one of the smartest people I've ever known, but he was a nerd. And I protected them. 
I protected them on the playground. I played with them. I go to my bike to their house all the time. I went to Grodden at 12 years old. I'd been gone less than a year when both of them killed themselves. I made them my friends. I've never forgotten. Every Christmas I'd ride by where their houses were. Now they're at mansions where their houses were. And I sit there and wonder if somehow I failed. They brought to school. I don't know if you all know anything about Groton Square Park and Roosevelt and it's where the world used to be run out of. Uh, we studied theology for six years every semester. Attended church eight times a week, every day and twice on Sunday. We read and studied philosophy and human emotion. I read and studied every passage in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I sang in the choir for six years. I sang in the choir and loved singing until I gave a 12-hour seminar at the University of Tennessee and lost my voice. Never been able to sing since. That's why I hate the University of Tennessee. <laughs> I, I loved my experience at Grob. Our pastors were the essence of Christianity. They were the most important men in my life. The three most things, most important things that brought to me were the beauty and peace of religion, reading the diary of Anne Frank, and spending time with Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King came to speak to God, and the headmaster, for whatever his reason, the, 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 uh, the faculty had voted to make me leave school because I couldn't keep up with those really smart Yankees. <laughs> and he vetoed that and said one day that the school would be proud that I graduated from there. And he chose me to show Dr. King around the school. I thought Dr. King, King was an old man. He was about 35. <laughs> <laughs> and there are lots of things to be talked about, but the thing that I, I really remember the most is I, I was the third North Carolinian to ever go to Rob. And I was, I think it was the 12th Southerner to go to Brock. Uh, and he said to me, he said, Joe, what's it like being a Southern boy up here with all these rich Yankees? And I said, well, Dr. King, it's really, it's, it's hard. It's difficult. He said, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, all these people up here think we're stupid. They think we're racist. They think we're stupid. They think we wear bib overalls. They think we eat chicken, broiled chicken with our hands. And he said, well, you're learning a little bit about prejudice, aren't you? I said, yes, sir, I guess I am. He said, well, I'll tell you something. I much prefer Southern prejudice to Northern prejudice. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, Southerners hate us as a race and love us as people. Northerners love us as a race and hate us as people. He said, I think I can do something about the first. I'm not sure I can ever do anything about the second. And the next day, I marched with him in the front of the Roxbury in Boston. Civil Rights March, Roxbury in Boston being probably the most racist place in America at the time. In my mind, all those things meshed into one, and I began to search for what I would be and how I would spend my life. The diary of Anne Frank had a tremendous impact on me. I wanted to teach. It's all I wanted to do my whole life. I wanted to teach and be that coach that you brought your son back to and said, son, I want you to meet Coach Cheshire. He had such a big influence on my life. Well, I fell in love with my wife the summer of my freshman year, and my dad actually liked her. <laughs> And they conspired so that on our honeymoon, my wife and I, we were now juniors, we were riding over around Maine. And Carolyn says, Joe, there's something I have to tell you. And I said, well, what's that, honey? She said, you're not going to like it. 
I said, Carolyn, we're on our honeymoon. It's a beautiful day. I love you. What can you tell me I wouldn't like? She said, I didn't marry a high school teacher. So here I am. I joined a civil defense firm and, and got on the court appointed list. They didn't like it much, but I did. My first trial was a first degree murder case. I got an acquittal when I didn't even have a clue what I was doing. And that's the truth. I tried 35 civil jury trials, but I quickly learned that to me, civil law was about money and criminal law was about people, prejudice, and the poor and the mean and the greedy and the misunderstood and the unloved. And the challenge of that human emotion trumped money for me. And I became a criminal lawyer. I once wrote, introducing my mentor, Wade Smith, that criminal law is a per criminal lawyer is a person who loves people more than he loves himself, who loves freedom more than the comfort of security, who is unafraid to fight for unpopular ideas and ideals, who is willing to stand next to the uneducated, the poor, the dirty, the suffering, and even the mean, greedy, and violent, and advocate for them not just in words but in spirit who is willing to stand up to the arrogant, mean-spirited, caring and uncaring with courage, strength and patience, and not be intimidated, who bleeds a little when someone else goes to jail, who dies a little when tolerance and freedom suffer, and most importantly, a person who never loses hope that love and forgiveness will win in the end. What in my Christian faith and education led me to the ministry of criminal law? And to me, it is a ministry. People who know me well, and there's some of you in this room that know me well, know to me it is a ministry. I respect the Judeo-Christian tradition both as stated in the Old and New Testaments. But I take many of my personal beliefs and professional considerations straight from the teachings of Jesus as given us in the New Testament especially as Jesus' word modifies or explains the harsh Old Testament law. Jesus never ridiculed the law of Moses, or he never even tried to change it. Instead, he became, in my view, a living example of how the law should be lived and taught that love is the heart of law and reason for law. In Matthew, Jesus says, You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I say, whoever slaps you on the right cheek, then turn the left cheek to me. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, never will your Father forgive yours. Judge not, lest ye be judged, which is my favorite for modern politicians, prosecutors, judges, and defense lawyers who practice not for good but for power, office, or money. These teachings have been lost too often, lost in our society as a whole. In the Gospel of John, is told the story of the adulteress who the elders ordered stoned to death. We all know this. Stoned to death according to the existing legal standards. Jesus famously said, you, are without, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. When the lawmakers all left, Jesus told the adulteress, then neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Today, we follow the sentencing guidelines and put her in prison for four years. Ones who are properly motivated do not search to get the guilty off. They exist to hold the power of government, an often morally and politically corrupt self-centered and judgmental entity to its burden but more uh, we exist to keep that from happening to ordinary citizens we exist to forgive the violation to understand the reason to treat the person to minimize the loss by assisting our clients in redemption, in jobs, in education, in treatment, and love. 
One of my favorite stories just happened two years ago. I'm walking down the street, going to the courthouse, and I see this couple coming towards me. African-American man and a white woman and two beautiful little children. And I said to myself, I know that man, but I couldn't remember how I knew him. And so I was walking towards him. I kind of moved out. And he said, Mr. Cheshire, Mr. Cheshire, do you remember me? And I said, I remember your face. I don't remember who you are. He said, eight years ago, I came to you. I was completely addicted to heroin. I couldn't keep a job. You got me in treatment. You paid for my treatment because I had nothing. When I got out, I was looking at 20 years. You got me a year and a day. I spent eight months. I came out. I met this lovely woman and married her. These are my two children. I'm now the manager of X Store out on downtown Boulevard, doing really well. I said to myself, there's no quarter of a million dollar fee in the world that's better than that. Jesus died for our sins and was resurrected. Something I think we forget in modern day too often. Criminal defendants and the poor in our society are often morally, spiritually, economically, educationally, and emotionally dead. We, we, have the opportunity to minimize their exposure and through love and direction resurrect their lives. And every person in this room, everyone, has the ability to do that. It's only a question of whether you have the will. You have the ability. And there's no greater feeling, I'm telling you, than when you do that. Just none. There's no sex. There's no vacation. There's no big house. There's no car. There's no nothing like the feeling of touching a person's life like that. The Bible teaches that punishment is not for revenge, but to reduce crime and reform the criminal, a concept our country now ignores. In the book of James, Jesus says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let them know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And finally, in Matthew, the famous saying, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. These are the teachings that moved me to the ministry of criminal law. To me, my neighbors, not just lawyers, doctors, businessmen, country club members, politicians, and teachers, but also the poor, the disenfranchised, the hopeless, the unemployed and unemployable. They are so often the people I see as clients. And lastly, as a criminal lawyer, I fight power. And power, especially political power, is too often evil. And certainly uncaring, no matter how it professes piety or what party it belongs to. There was a 60 Minutes show that came on in 2015. I'd ask you all if some of you are interested in, in looking at it. I've been blessed in my life to walk two innocent people off death row and walk one person who was serving a life sentence, who was an innocent man, set him free. That was a blessing. I never got paid a penny for any of that, but it was truly a blessing. This 60 Minutes show is about a man just like that and uh, about how innocent he was. But the prosecutor who handled the case had more people on death row than any other person in America. And he said, to, he said, this prosecutor, he said, that's my duty to put people on death row. No. Your duty is to see that justice is done. Justice is not always winning. If we are Christians or just humans, 
We, we are in the compassion business. As, a, as an aside, when I die, I don't know if I'll go to heaven. I have absolutely no clue. I mean, to be honest with you, I don't even know if there is a heaven. I like to believe there is. I like to try to work towards it. But none of us really know. No matter how much faith we really have, we're going to shut our eyes and be surprised whatever happens. Um, I lost my place saying that. Oh, yeah, when, when I die, if I get to go to heaven, I'm going to immediately go to St. Peter and ask if I can have a job prosecuting federal judges <laughs> and state judges and certain prosecutors and people who created the horror of the sentencing guidelines because I could spend my eternity doing that happily. <laughs> we are the world's self-proclaimed greatest democracy. We are labeled by many politicians as a Christian nation. Yet, in the United States of America, I want you all to listen carefully to this, we have 4.5% of the world's population in our great democracy. 4.5% is all we got. But we have 25% of the world's prisoners. Now you think about that. 25% of the world's prisoners. And most of you all have no clue of that. You think we're forgiving people. We're kind people. We're gentle people. Well, no, we're not. Particularly if you're black or Hispanic. We have 2.2 million people in our prisons and jails over the last 40 years, since I was 43 years old, we've had a 500% increase in people in prisons. And this is under Republicans and Democrats. This is not a political party issue. It's a moral issue. An additional 4.75 million Americans are subject to probation or parole as I speak to you. Even though crime rates in the United States, politicians would never let you believe this, but crime rates in the United States have declined steadily every year for 24 years. The prisons just grow and grow. They're a business now. Even though violent crimes have decreased steadily for 20 years, one in nine persons in prison are serving a life sentence. One in nine. And most of these, ladies and gentlemen, are the least of us. 40% of our prisoners, I just, I just want you to try to gather this in your mind, 40% of our nation's prisoners are black. They're black males. One in nine African-American males between 20 and 34 years of age is now in prison. If the present rates hold, one third of black males will have served active time in their lifetimes. And with all this comes disenfranchisement, unemployability, and recidivism. What else can you do? You know, I, I, my draft number was eight. Ones of you that are by will know how horrifying and terrifying that was. I was a little guy from North Carolina, I'd been educated at fancy Yankee prep school, going to Wake Forest Law School, or was going to Wake Forest Law School. I didn't know black people. I didn't know Hispanic people. I didn't know poor white people. They were tricky. When I went in the army, I was the only college-educated person in my basic training with Tim. Now, I'm going to tell you something I learned. I didn't give a damn whether you were Puerto Rican or black or poor white or rich white or European heritage. If I needed to get over that wall, man, I needed your help. And I learned in the Army that none of us are, when you boil it down, when you take our clothes off, when you cut our hair off, 
When you put us through the same trauma, nobody is different than anybody else. That's just the truth. And if I were God or I were the emperor of America, the first thing I would do is I would say that every American citizen at the age of 18 has to do two years public service. It can be in the army, it can be taking care of the elderly, it can be fixing the infrastructure, it has to have a basic training component to it, and you can't do it in the quadrant of the country where you were raised. So that we could know each other again. So that we could know that we're all so that we could fight against this terror that our own government is instilling in our poor people and in our Hispanic people, who are some of the hardest working people ever. And with the black people, what we've done to them over all these years, and it's almost worse now than it's ever been. 20% of our prison population is Hispanic. We have taken humanness out of sentencing. Compassion is impossible as we apply our Orwellian mathematical grid to punish humans without interest in forgiveness, compassion, rehabilitation, and no one cares about the future human consequences. Even conservatives like the Koch brothers are finally figuring it out now in this Federalist society. But it takes decades to undo these types of things. Poor people in America, I see them every day. I live with them every day. They have the hope. They're uneducated, unemployable, disenfranchised, and used as fodder for political gains. But we expect of them what we expect of the middle class and the privileged. When they sell drugs to support themselves because there are no jobs, we incarcerate them at a higher and higher level. When they come out of prison, they're totally disenfranchised and can't get jobs. Jeremiah chapter 22 verses 15, 16 says, Do you think you are a king because you compete in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well. Is not this to know me, declares the Lord. In other words, if one really wants to know God, the only thing needed is justice for the poor and the needy. I do not choose to engage in the selfish, selfish and cruel punishment of generations of Americans. I have chosen to fight it, as should all Christians. I represented the first man who was executed in North Carolina when they brought the death penalty back. And it was uh, James Hutchins, a terrible drinker, probably killed a couple of law enforcement officers. He'd been in prison for 40 years. He became a deeply devout Christian that every, every guard loved. He was the conscience of death row. I couldn't save his life. We got two, three stays. I went to say goodbye to James and he said to me, Joe, there's not going to be anybody here for me. Would you come and watch? Well, I wasn't ready for that. And he said, if you'll hold, hold this Bible verse in your hand, I would appreciate it. I still have the little Bible he gave me in my office. I still have it tagged to Micah 6, 8, where it says, he has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with thy God? I didn't see a single solitary prison guard who wasn't crying when James died. But we killed him. As I see Jesus' teachings, they're challenging and humbling. When I get discouraged with the sadness I see in my clients and their families or their victims, when I see the callousness of the justice system with its piousness and false righteousness of many of those who sit and pass judgment and call themselves Christian, of the hearty hypocrisy of the politicians who pass our laws when it seems that God has given me more than I can do, it helps to remember Jesus' words to his disciples. For human beings, it is impossible. But for God, all things are possible.
But God acts through us in this world. And there's so much for us to do. I choose to distinguish my life as a Christian from that of Christians in the days of manifest destiny and slavery. They will always have sons of ham to exploit as long as there is pork barrel funding to be had. But I will follow my heart and I ask you all to. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Tracy Chapman, who some of you all may know as a singer, I just love Tracy Chapman. She wrote this song, and it's one of my favorites ever. There's this line in it that says, If you saw the face of God in love, would you change? Because here's the truth, all of us need to change. And the life that I have been blessed to, to live is a life that teaches that it's been Never made lots and lots of money. Uh, I could have. But I've given a lot of humanness and helped a lot of people. Might sound terrible for me to say it, but the truth is I'm really proud of it. And I have to say it to myself to keep myself from doing it. To keep myself doing it. Because the pain of it is immense. I'd like to leave you all with this uh, fourfold Franciscan blessing that's been read at every Joseph Von Cheshire funeral. So some of you might live to hear it read one more time. <laughs> May God, but listen to this. This is amazing. May God bless you with discomfort and easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. May God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. And the blessing of God who creates, redeems, and sanctifies be upon you and all you love and pray for this day and forevermore. Amen. I thank you all for the, the privilege of letting me share this with you. I, as I was working on it, I, I worried that it sounded too self-important. That it, um, I didn't know how it felt. As I've said, I, I, don't see, I don't see myself the way other people see me. I'm not the person that my public image is always. If you ever want to really understand poor people, go to the back of the Good Shepherd Church. 10.30, 11 o'clock every morning. Talk to the people that are lined up there to get a free meal. Feel their hearts. Listen to their stories. When you hear of somebody committing a crime somewhere, don't make a judgment until you think about where they came from, why they did it. I really truly believe that God loves all of us. And I truly believe in the words of Jesus. I really do. 
And I like to say to people, if you can point me to one place in the New Testament where Jesus says it's okay to even hurt someone's feelings, please do. So thank you for this opportunity. Jamie, I don't know where you are or if you're even here. But uh, he, he, he sucked me into doing this at St. Stephen's. And then, I mean, you know, when the preacher calls, you can't say no. So thank you.